SJC 12440, Cambridge Street Realty, LLC v. Melinda Stewart, and SJC 12563, Melinda Stewart v. Cambridge Street Realty, LLC. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor, and may it please the court, Joshua Bone, representing appellant Melinda Stewart. I would like to begin with the main appeal in this case, number 12440, and in particular, with the defective notice to quit that was issued to Ms. Stewart in the summer of 2016. Defective because it didn't comply with the lease, right? That's correct. Uh, the notice to quit, I'm sorry. But, the, but you already had but the uh, notice to quit that did come was uh, reasonably uh, fulsome as far as um, telling you what it was that was going on. You didn't, what was confusing about it? So, Your Honor, I, the first thing I would say in response to that is that this court has recognized on numerous occasions that the notice to quit has to be effective on its own terms, that prejudice to the tenant is not the relevant inquiry in this context. And that makes sense because in a context like this, the notice to quit is a contractual condition precedent to the ability of the landlord to terminate the tenancy. And I think in general, when interpreting contractual conditions precedent, this court and most other courts have required strict compliance with unambiguous contractual terms. Uh, we would argue that the contractual terms here- Have to be said in a particular way is what you're really saying, not, not that the substance of this is- uh... Different. In this particular lease, I think that's correct, Your Honor. Uh, if you look at the specific language of this lease, it doesn't say, please convey the following information. It says, please include the following language with a quotation mark and then very specific language laid out. And we think that that's an unambiguous contractual term mandating use of that particular language rather than some alternative paraphrase that may or may not convey the same meaning. And you don't think we could do a substantial compliance we don't think that substantial compliance is the test here, Your Honor, again, because of the specific language of this term, and also because of the cases we cite in our briefing, where this court has recognized in the past that a notice to quit has to be compliant with both contractual and statutory requirements, regardless of whether any prejudice resulted to the tenant. And I'd point you in particular to Shannon v. Jacobson, which we cite in our opening brief, where there was no question that the tenant received notice that the tenancy was terminated. Well, the word was skipped. Uh, yeah, in that, in that case, the, so I think if one word were skipped or a comma were misplaced, this would be a very different case. I think it's possible in that context, although I don't think the court has to reach the issue, that, you know, as with any contract that might be seen as a de minimis breach that wouldn't really give rise to any, uh, any action on the part of the tenant. But I think here, there was no attempt whatsoever to include the specific language that was actually mandated in the contract. And that distinguishes this case from one that might have involved a misplaced comma or some other minor defect that wouldn't potentially, in the end, give rise to the same arguments we're raising. Explain to us what was wrong with the notice to quit. Uh, the notice to quit was defective because the notice to quit under the contract had to include the specific recital outlined in the lease agreement. Uh, as with any contract, Ms. Stewart agreed to particular terms, some of which may have benefited her, some of which may have benefited the other party. And one of the terms that Ms. Stewart agreed to was a contractual provision that guaranteed her particular notice. And I think Ms. Stewart is entitled to the benefit of her bargain in this case. And that means that Ms. Stewart was entitled to a notice to quit that complied perfectly with the notice provisions that were outlined in the lease agreement, as well as all overriding statutory obligations the landlord may have also had to comply with. So that language, which is arcane sort of, your tenancy can be terminated only at the end of the initial term or at the end of the successor term for other good cause or during the initial term or successive term for serious or repeated violation, that language had to be almost word for word included um, or the notice is deficient. That's our position, Your Honor, and I think it's important to take a step back and recognize. But even though that language is pretty useless to someone who's not a lawyer, um, we, and the notice that was actually given is extremely detailed and specific about what she was doing wrong. So, Your Honor, I'm not sure that notice actually is useless to someone who's not a lawyer. I think what that notice does is it very clearly and succinctly states the background rules the landlord has to comply with in order to terminate the tenancy effectively, and then, following on those background rules, requires the landlord to clearly spell out the particular basis for lease termination. 
So I think just as when anyone is making a legal argument, it often makes sense to begin with the rule and then apply it. That's effectively what this lease agreement is mandating, that form of notice. By the way, can you talk a teeny bit softer? Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, go yes. ahead. <laughs> so I, you know, so I think that that's, that that's what this lease agreement requires, is that particular form of notice. And I think given that that particular form of notice was something that Ms. Stewart agreed to when she entered into the lease agreement, just as she agreed to many other terms that may have operated to the landlord's benefit, that there's no basis to disregard that contractual provision and allow the landlord to write sort of whatever notice they may want. I think opening that door would potentially lead to notices to quit that may not, in fact, serve the interests of tenants. Uh, I think, it, in fact, if you take a, a step back from this, there's a, probably a reason that BHA mandates this particular language, and it's likely because BHA has determined that this language is effective in communicating to tenants what their rights are in cases like this. Do we uh, have any cases interpreting that? I'm, I, you, you're relying on a 19, like 18 case, which is probably before the BHA. So are there any cases interpreting this notice provision? Your Honor, there are housing court cases interpreting this notice provision. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't lead you to particular sites, although I'm happy to provide them later. Uh, in terms of cases from this court, no, and there's also no evidence in the record indicating what the specific purpose of this provision is. Uh, my argument is simply that I think it's intuitive that the reason BHA would want to include a particular language-based notice would be that BHA had some reason to think that notice would effectively communicate rights to individuals who would receive it. But it would mean that in any case in which there was a jurisdictional question, you'd have to, you'd have, to have strict compliance with the... Uh, with whatever lease requirements there were or statutory requirements, strict compliance, which mm -hmm. means using the language, not necessarily the substance. Your Honor, in a lease like Ms. Stewart's that requires a recitation of particular language, that's correct. If this court agrees that a compliant notice to quit is a jurisdictional predicate to a summary process action, then any case involving a requirement like the one here, it would in fact be a jurisdictional defect if they failed to include a strict recitation of the language the tenant agreed to when she originally signed the lease. I really want to press you on what was missing substantively. Your Honor, I The language that you want. Your Honor, I, required in these, I, really, I want to know what substantive measure or, or, or concept was missing. Your Honor, I don't think we're resting our position on a missing substantive concept. Are you saying so there's nothing missing? So I, I think that substantively, in terms of providing over the course of multiple pages, all of the pieces of information that are required in, the, in Clause 13E. Hmm? The notice to quit was pretty succinct, I thought. I, I think that over the course of probably two or three pages. They, they effectively accomplished to say the bulk of what was in here, with the potential exception of the 1530-day distinction that's in the 13E provision, but I don't think appears in the notice to quit. Uh, I think our position, though, is that the substance of notice is not the only thing that's relevant to whether an individual has received their contractual rights. I think the form of notice, especially in a case like this, is also very important. We're dealing with a population that, in many cases, lacks a familiarity with legal documents. That's that in this case. In this you're asking case. us to do something that would affect all leases, um, all notices to quit. I think that's correct, Your Honor, but I think as a general matter in the housing courts, many tenants are situated in a similar position as Not Ms. all Stewart. tenants are, ten are Section 8 tenants. That's true. And I think many leases won't include a provision requiring a specific recitation of language, like the one here. That is a, a product of the Section 8 lease that Ms. Stewart has. Uh, but I think that any tenant who enters into a lease that guarantees that tenant a particular recitation of notice should get the benefit of their bargain on the back end if the tenancy is attempted to be terminated. But, but if we look at the population that you're concerned about and we follow you, you what you're saying is if you cut and paste, that's sufficient. That's correct. All right. But if a landlord endeavored not to cut and paste, and then explained in plain English the defect, that's not enough. That's correct, Your Honor. I think if the tenant had entered in- How does that help tenants' rights? So I think that the, the, the balance that's ultimately struck in this BHA lease is a sensible balance where uh, the idea is if you mandate the inclusion of particular notice as a uniform matter across notices to quit, and that notice is deemed to be sufficient, overall you're going to be more protective of tenants' rights because you're going to guarantee at least the sufficient notice that's guaranteed in the lease. With a legally dense um, lease provision as opposed to someone endeavoring to write it in plain English. 
Your Honor, but I think in most... That's the rule you want us to adopt. Your Honor, I think in a lease that guarantees particular notice like this one, and I don't think, again, that this is so the lease in particular. So your answer to my question is yes. Oh, I, yes. The answer to your question okay. is yes, Your Honor. I think that's right. And I think, again, that comes back to the fact that this is particular notice that Ms. Stewart was guaranteed when she entered into the lease agreement in the first place. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, it's a sensible decision on the part of the BHA to guarantee every Section 8 client particular notice that establishes the rights of that tenant rather than leaving it to the discretion of the landlord on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether to be conciliatory and provide the sort of plain English notice you're talking about or instead provide a notice that might be entirely confusing, but substantively, if you parse all of the language, happens to communicate the message that the, that the language in this lease requires. In determining whether or not there's substantial compliance with a contract or a lease or anything else, judges do this all the time. I think that's right, Your Honor, but I think when there's an unambiguous contractual provision like this, which is structured as guaranteeing a right to particular language included in the lease, it's not substantial compliance to include language that isn't the same as the language that's mandated. If this were, again, a requirement that the landlord convey particular substantive information, then I think the answer might be different. The answer in that case might well be that this notice to quit, although perhaps not the best possible notice to quit we could imagine, substantively communicated to Ms. Stewart what her rights were. But this provision, I think, unambiguously guarantees particular language, not particular substance. Um, I, guess, I guess I'm going to be a little bit less subtle than some of these questions. <laughs> uh, th th this sounds like a big, it doesn't matter whether it was enough to put the person on, on, on notice. Um, this th this um, jurisdictional argument sounds like a big gotcha. And there's a lot of landlords out there who, if they don't have uh, the rent, from the second and third floor, lose their home. Um, and, and what you're really asking for because in response to all of these questions is, is, is real gotcha. Your Honor, I think two responses to that. So the first is I think it's important to note that if you accept our jurisdictional argument, then what actually would happen in the vast majority of cases is a dismissal without prejudice, and that would not have claim preclusive this effect. This is August 31st, 2016, that the summary process began in this case, more than two years ago. It's that's not correct. at all that would happen. No, no, that's, that's correct, Your Honor. I'm just making sure that, that the stakes of this case are, are clear and that you know, there would be nothing precluding a subsequent action. But absolutely, there would be some delay created by the rule that we're talking about. I think, again, that delay is a creature of the summary process statute itself. I think the summary process statute, as we argue in our brief, establishes that as a jurisdictional predicate to bringing a summary process action, a landlord has to comply with 239.1. And 239.1 says that one thing you have to do is you can only bring an action after the determination of a lease by its own limitation or by notice to quit or otherwise. Well, let's, let's suppose we adopt the position that uh, something could be jurisdictional. So okay. an adequate notice to quit is a jurisdictional prerequisite. Let's adopt that let's, for the sake of argument. Mm -hmm. That does not necessarily mean that it has to be strict compliance. That's correct. Uh, again, Your Honor, I, I think that the strict compliance argument in this case comes from the specific language of Ms. Stewart's right. lease. And it's not it's a different argument than whether or not this should be jurisdictional. Well, that's absolutely right, Your Honor. I'm sorry, I took Justice Lowy's argument uh, point to be that if we make this jurisdictional, then we're potentially opening up uh, a number of opportunities for delay in the process. Uh, and so I was simply addressing okay. addressing that concern in my, in, my, in my response. If it's jurisdictional, it can't be waived, and so if somebody has rented to somebody, evicted them, put a new tenant in, and then eight months later somebody brings a motion to say the notice to quit was insufficient and it's a jurisdictional defect, does that mean that the tenant gets to go back in? So, Your Honor, my understanding is that there's, it's somewhat complicated, but under Rule 60, Oftentimes, you're not allowed to bring up a jurisdictional argument that was aware that you were that you could have been aware of um, at the, before final judgment entered. Uh, so, if there were a final judgment in the case, uh, I think that it's not 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 at all clear that someone could bring up a notice to quit, say, two or three years later, and try to reopen the case through a Rule 60b motion. Um, it's certainly the case, Your Honor, that before final judgment enters. 
this argument could be raised on appeal. And if the eviction had been stayed pending appeal, or had not been stayed pending appeal, I'm sorry, and another tenant had been brought into the apartment, that if on the back end it turns out that the tenant was right all along, then the tenancy would be reinstated and that new tenant would not be allowed to remain. And that's absolutely correct, Your Honor. I think that unfortunately, uh, that's a real world consequence of the fact that tenants need to have their rights protected on the front end by sufficient notices to quit that inform them of the basis of eviction and also effectively ensure that their rights are protected in the system moving forward. Forward. Well, why is it? A, I, I have trouble understanding why it's a jurisdictional argument as opposed to, I mean, we want these issues decided in the housing court. Um, you're, we, you know, it, it just seems odd. I mean, you, you've got a strict compliance, but you also are turning it into a jurisdictional question as opposed to a contractual interpretation question. Uh, I, I, I don't. What is Shannon a jurisdictional case? Your Honor, uh, this court. Uh, Wait, is Shannon a tenant case or is it a mortgage case? I, Shannon is a tenant case. A tenant case, and it says this kind of. I mean, again, you're back in the days of rigidity, which we hopefully have moved away from. But it, it just seems like you're proposing solutions that don't seem to work. You know, in the sense that you know, I, I just have real trouble with the jurisdiction issue, as opposed to. This is something the housing court should decide correctly or not. So, Your Honor, again, I think I would point you to the language of the summary process statute, which I think is ultimately the gravamen in any jurisdictional case. It's a question of whether the legislature intended a particular class of people to be able to bring a particular type of action. But what's the language in the statute that makes this a jurisdictional question? Sure. If the lessee of land or tenements or a person holding under him holds possession without right after the determination of a lease by its own limitation or by notice to quit or otherwise, then uh, the landlord may bring a summary process action effectively. There's no discussion of jurisdiction in that language. There's not, Your Honor, but I think the language after the determination of a lease by its own limitation or by notice to quit or otherwise establishes a jurisdictional predicate. Uh, the effect, I think that's actually consistent with this court's decision in Hatcher from last spring, where the court also looked at 239.1 as defining the class of people withstanding to bring a summary process action and determined that one class of people who fall outside the scope of this language are those who don't own the place in the first place. I think similarly, if you look at- Did we decide that there was no jurisdiction? In Hatcher, the answer was that there was no standing, so no subject matter jurisdiction. That's correct. Um, and in this case, I think the same rule would hold uh, based on the language of this provision, which doesn't allow one to bring the action until one has either served a valid notice to quit or the lease has been terminated by its own terms. The sufficiency of notice, it just seems to me that it's more of a defense. So, Your Honor, I think that, and, and one other thing that I, that I would point out is the rule we're advocating for has been adopted in other jurisdictions. We cite them in our brief, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Um, and so this rule is, is one that, that is not sort of coming out of whole cloth here. Uh, but, but I think that the reason that the notice to quit in this case is not sort of purely a contractual issue, but it should be treated as jurisdictional, is that the notice to quit is a legal document which has a legal effect. It's not simply a notice document providing someone information of their rights. The notice to quit is the functional uh, document that terminates the underlying tenancy. So before one can bring an action for summary process, where one claims a right to occupy land that's currently occupied by somebody else, it makes perfect sense that one would have to, as a jurisdictional predicate, eliminate that other person's right to be there pursuant to a valid lease. Uh, because the notice to quit accomplishes that objective, the notice to quit serves as the jurisdictional predicate for the summary process action. And I think that's what distinguishes a notice to quit from any other type of contract we might be talking about that we wouldn't necessarily term jurisdictional. I, I see that my time is well passed. I, I want to make sure if there are any questions on the other case, I'm happy to handle them. Otherwise, I'm happy to rely rest. upon the briefs for that. So thank, thank you, Your thank Honor. You. Mr. Papadopoulos, good morning. Good morning, Chief Justice. Associate Justices, may it please the court, my name is Eleftherios Papadopoulos and I represent Cambridge Street Realty. I think the substance over form argument is the strongest consideration that this court needs to really consider because we respectfully submit Judge Winnick did not commit any error of law in determining whether or not the notice to quit was effective to terminate the tenancy of Ms. Stewart. He also didn't and I know it's the second issue which hasn't really been addressed by the court, he did not commit an error of law when he proceeded with the trial on the same day that her motion to vacate the default judgment was allowed. Well, I have some problems with that. And, and Your Honor, I'll, I'll address it without a question really being presented in that sense. 
the, the issue of whether or not her due process rights had been violated, I understand is a consideration for the trial judge and under 185C section 8A, a judge has discretion for continuances and potentially allowing continuances when requested. I don't believe a request had ever formally been made by Mrs. Stewart. Attorney Whiting, who appeared on a limited assistance basis, and then, indicated and then during- went, went to the, And then just took off. She, she did just take off, Your Honor, but during that motion, which was a motion to vacate the default judgment. That was all it was. That was all it was on that day. It was a motion to vacate. It wasn't, there was uh, not uh, anything uh, suggesting that there might be a trial. Uh, Your Honor, a motion to vacate default judgment requires two elements. I think that's the point that we haven't really given too much consideration to and wasn't really addressed okay. in, the, in the original opening brief by Mrs. Stewart, which is ultimately, in order to prevail on a motion to vacate the default judgment, you not only have to establish the fact that you had a valid basis for not appearing on that day, but that you had a meritorious defense to the underlying claim. To say you appear on that day on your motion to vacate your default judgment unbeknownst to you that you might actually have to prove your meritorious defense simply just doesn't comply. State your meritorious. You have to just state it. You don't have to prove it. Your Honor, I don't think that the standard is simply stating it. I think you do have to establish. You have to show it, but you don't have to do it by, by a preponderance or any of the trial standards, I don't think. I think that is just a, um, a basis on which a judge would decide whether or not to allow the default to be listed. Lifted. Correct, Your Honor. And, and the judge did allow the default to be lifted. Correct, Your Honor. So and, the, and, the, and the judge indicated... Both prongs were met. Correct, Your Honor. And, and the judge immediately thereafter indicated, and we will go to trial today. No objection was raised at that point. Uh, no indication... No, no, no lawyer was present to raise it either. The lawyer was present during the original motion to vacate the default, Your but Honor. But not when they were going to trial. The lawyer had taken... No, Your off. Honor. And she was there on a limited assistance basis. Right. So Her basis was to vacate the default. So once established, and one of the other elements which hasn't really been addressed in the briefs, is that limited assistance representation, and even in the forms provided that's part of the record appendix, also identifies that you need to make clear for the individual that you're working with on the scope of your representation and to what limitations that applies. Now, Attorney Whiting is well-versed, uh, somebody who's in the housing court all the time. I cannot imagine uh, that there would be any recommendation that this motion may be vacated and it, you're in all likelihood not going to trial that day. That's exactly what happens in the housing court any time a motion to vacate is well, well, because one more week can have catastrophic effects. It's not that the one week, Your Honor, and I, I imagine there's a little bit of sarcasm in the, in the question. Oh, no, I mean for the, I'm not <laughs> kidding. No, it, it's really serious. I spent a lot of time in the Lynn no. District Court in, in, in the summary process session. It can be a brutal thing to have to wait another week it, the landlord it very well can. Depending on the circumstances yeah. of a summary process case, I do agree that those circumstances, whether it's a situation of, uh, you know, disturbances, drugs, you name it, those types week. of terminations, yes. And that's why, that's the entire reason why I think 239 section 1 and the entire summary process statute is, as Judge Kafka indicated earlier, it's a summary basis. The idea, I, I apologize, I think it was you, Judge Lowy, that indicated that it's a summary basis. It's meant to be quick. And a so, lot of times in the housing in housing court or in the in the uh, district court, um, that week continuance, the 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 um, tenant is pro se, and the landlord is pro se, um, and so the judge, when he gives the one week continuance after the default with a two prong showing, um, to 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 help the pro se litigant. Well, there's another pro se litigant on the other side of the V oftentimes. That wasn't true here, though. Can, Correct, Your Honor. Can, can, I, can I ask you about yes, a, either a scheduling order or any type of notice that went out to the court as to what this hearing was for? Was, was there anything on paper that would have alerted the pro se uh, uh, plaintiff to the fact that, um, that this was going to be a trial? You're, you're indicating the pro se uh, pro, 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 pro se tenant, I'm sorry. I'm your Honor, the pro se tenant um, indicated in one of the documents within the record as well, which is her on her motion for reconsideration, that she specifically indicated that I was told that I was given a new date. So okay. in the record, she is aware that she has a new date. Now, when the court, when she files that motion, she is then sent a notice from the housing court indicating the date that the hearing will be set for. And to answer yeah, your I question. A hearing to vacate the default judgment. Correct, Your Honor. And it says that this is what the next matter is that's being set. Now, right. the summons and complaint, on the other hand, 
indicates very clearly, as the forms I, I don't know if your justices are familiar with, specifically indicate not only the trial date in two separate sections on the complaint, on the writ, but it also in very clear and bold language on the bottom, which is part of the record, specifically says that your answer date is on the Monday before that trial date. And that that is your opportunity to not only file an answer, but to potentially request discovery. Ms. Stewart, in this particular case, did none of that. And I think Judge Lowy accurately identified this notice to quit was served on August 31st. The complaint was served in October. The, no the, the notice to quit, the complaint, in terms of notice, the, the very clear language on the bottom of the form indicating she has the ability to file an answer, nothing came. In fact, on the date of trial, she appeared late. And throughout the course of the record, you'll see that at one point it was because she was directed to the wrong court. Judge uh, Attorney Whiting indicates that it's not because she was directed to the wrong court, but actually because she was there and came late. And then in a separate part of the record, she, uh, I apologize, in the brief, it's indicated that she was directed to a different location. She appears at 9.30 and during the hearing on a motion for reconsideration specifically says to the court that she arrived late. It's stamped at 10.25, her motion to vacate the default judgment. And again, I understand that uh, the one court had entered right, One had entered right away. Excuse me, Your Honor? A default judgment had entered right away when she didn't show up in time. Your Honor, the process of the housing court is that there's a first call of the list, yep. at which point uh, a default judgment may enter. You have to file that default judgment. It did enter here, right? It, it did, Your Honor. So yeah, the call so of the list she, happens So the, fact that, so the fact that she was doing it at 1025 meant that she was on and on pretty quickly. Oh, no, Your Honor. So the default judgment doesn't enter at 9 o'clock. The, uh, in the housing court, especially the Eastern Housing Court, the Boston Housing Court, Judge Winnick or Judge Muir had very regularly, and on this day as well, will come out and explain to the litigants the exact process that will take place. That may take place at 9.15, it may take place at 9.30. The call of the list happens thereafter by the clerk of the court. And very often we're talking about 200 cases. So the actual default and the time that it occurred, I did not specifically document, but I can assure you did not occur at 9 o'clock, did not occur at 9.30. In fact, I think the stamp 10.30 time on the motion to vacate the default is maybe a little bit more telling about the time frames here and when actually that request might have been filed because she arrived late. But she must that have issue, known Your that Honor, the, She uh, must have known that she wasn't able to go to trial that day, that the judgment had entered. Uh, Your Honor, and again, very customarily in that housing court, and it's in my brief as well, I was there the entire day, Your Honor and very regularly I'm there until one or two o'clock. And what typically will happen is that the housing court will let me know that your tenant has showed up late. That did not occur that day. Regardless, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stressing the point that this default should have stood. Because again, I think the judge in his sound discretion, which is under 185C section eight, vacated that default. And a judgment on the merits is certainly much more appropriate in the housing court than a judgment insisted upon default. And I certainly would have agreed that that would have potentially been an abuse of discretion. I don't think it's an abuse of discretion for the judge to have proceeded that day with the trial. And at that time, she had at least guidance by Attorney Whiting. Not a There's trial. There's lawyer for the day outside. Not a trial. She didn't. She did not have regular guidance well, at the trial. Attorney Whiting did actually appear at the beginning of that trial, and it, it, it's within the transcript, Your Honor. And she, at that point, once the trial had actually commenced, she withdrew. She withdrew. Yes, Your Honor. So I actually had. She didn't ask for th this was not Your she Honor. She didn't ask for a continuance. Uh, no, she actually said that we would be requesting a continuance and we are willing to put in a full appearance. Now, under the standing order, a full appearance may, at that point, require the court to actually continue uh, continue the case in order for the attorney to become apprised of the case. That's why I think this case is akin to Commonwealth versus Jackson. In that case, Your Honor, and granted a criminal proceeding, the election to forego counsel does not then allow that pro se litigant to make the argument of I'm proceeding pro se. It was, it was her decision not to go on with counsel? It was her, Your Honor, the decision always. To the if, part of the transcript that I, says I'm, that. Excuse me, Your Honor? Point me to the part of the transcript that says that. Please. That would be where Attorney Whiting indicates that she specific, and I believe it's uh, around, uh, I, I can get you a specific reference, Your Honor, but it's where Attorney Whiting specifically says, we are willing to enter a full appearance in this case and would be requesting a continuance. The only deduction I can make from that comment and what followed thereafter is that Ms. Stewart was not willing to retain Mrs. Whiting. Otherwise, that decision does not rest with Attorney Whiting alone. She specifically relayed to the court she's willing to provide a full appearance. Okay, I was not aware of this. It, can, excuse me? I was not aware of this. Well, 
uh, I was not aware of that. I thought that the Whiting uh, withdrew by her, uh, her own Oh, voice. no, she, she specifically indicated, I'm willing to enter a full appearance in this case. If I can turn you back to the issue of notice to quit. Uh, by the way, where is that in the record? I couldn't find it in the record. It's, well, it's, that there's, there's a reference to RA-9. It's at the beginning, Your Honor. It's a, I believe it's page uh, 9. I, I didn't, couldn't find it on Record Appendix 9, but maybe I looked at the wrong Record Appendix. I looked at Mr. Bone's Record Appendix 9, but that's a My Record Appendix does have it. Your Record <laughs> Appendix has it. Ah, uh, we have two Record Appendixes. Yes, okay. Your Honor. You might be looking at the second case, which is uh, 563. I see. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, so let, let me make sure I understand the contours of what you're saying. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, if there had been no notice to quit and you had proceeded simply to file a summary process action, is it jurisdictional that there's no notice to quit? 100% agree, Your Honor. And that would be because Chapter 239, Section 1 specifically indicates what the standing is necessary in order to get into the court. So, so it, is a, it is a matter of standing that there be a notice to quit? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, uh, if, you f if you were to prepare a notice to quit, which I know you would not do, but a less able attorney or perhaps a landlord without counsel, provides a notice to quit which does not provide substantial notice. Uh, is that jurisdictional? I, I don't believe it's jurisdictional, Your Honor, and I believe that that question is one perhaps left as a defense that that tenant might raise as to the effectiveness of the notice to quit. So your view is that if there is a notice to quit, that satis even if it's inadequate or, or fails to provide appropriate notice, it's still it's not jurisdictional. Now we're in the realm of a defense. Correct, Your Honor. And, and I do agree with Judge uh, Lowy's representation and yours right now that it is a, it's a defense, not a jurisdictional limitation. Uh, I'm just asking questions. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, okay, so your view is that it is a defense and that it, as a defense, your position is that if it's not presented, it is waived? Is that your position? Uh, I, in, in these circumstances, absolutely, Your Honor. I think it would be a different situation if standing, the issue of standing, as the court accurately said in Hatcher, in that situation, the individual, the, the, the name of the statute, I think, is important. Legislature did not merely put that in there for no reason. Parties entitled to summary process. So in the event that you don't establish standing, and I think under the circumstances you presented earlier, Your Honor, is what happens in the situation that somebody didn't have standing to bring the case. In that circumstance, I think the answer is yes, the tenant would potentially have the right to say, I need to be put back in there because the person who brought that case isn't even the owner, lessor, or landlord of this property. Right, that's of course not the issue here. So, Absolutely. Uh, so, okay, so let's assume there, so I'm just trying to follow through what you say should be our law, or is our law. Uh, notice to quit is filed, the uh, tenant files a motion to dismiss, claiming that the notice to quit is in some fashion inadequate. Uh, is the standard strict compliance, or substantial compliance, or material breach, what's the standard? I, I would I would suggest, Your Honor, that it be substantial compliance, uh, or that depending on the circumstances, and, and the reason I've cited the um, Fitch, uh, Fairfield uh, Housing Authority case, which was recently decided and granted not binding on this court, is that that notice to quit, which is appended, is extremely limited. Under the circumstances, not only is there an argument that it didn't comply with HUD guidelines, but it was very limited, but the circumstances warranted something different, that the tenant was aware of the situation and why she was being brought before the court. Now, the cases cited by my brother, which I, I appreciate were highlighted by not only my brother, but by the court, the separate jurisdictions don't deal with strict compliance on a lease. Every one of those cases talk about not complying with HUD. He also mentions that the Boston Housing Authority must have thought this was very important. Under Incorrectly cited by my brother, Section 982, CFR, uh, 24 CFR 982, Section 0.555, that applies to housing authority. 0 0.308 applies to landlords. And it specifically says that the landlord may use a standard lease, the landlord may use a housing authority lease. If that was a necessity, the housing authority would not have the option of providing either one lease or allowing a standard lease from a landlord to come in. So that argument that it's jurisdictional simply can't be appropriate. Now, Mr. Bone, your able opponent, says uh, in a determining whether there is substantial compliance, which he says is not the standard, you should consider whether or not the, the lease itself mandates certain language. Do you agree with that? Uh, your Honor, I think that is one of the considerations. 
I think if the court were to look specifically at that section, and it's under our, uh, the record appendix 62 and 69, what I have cited in my brief is that that language in and of itself is not only, in my opinion, confusing, it's contradictory to RA 69, which is the HUD addendum. The HUD addendum says that you can terminate for other good cause, and then it specifically identifies what sections constitute other good cause and delineates at which point other good cause can be filed during the initial term, at which point it can be filed after the initial term. The language that's actually cited by my brother and Judge Kafter read in the record says your tenancy can be terminated only at the end of the initial term or a successive term for other good cause, comma. That, sec that, that statement is actually incorrect because it can be terminated for other good cause during the initial term. There are circumstances under HUD, the HUD addendum, the tenancy addendum, but it's not that you can only terminate at the end of the initial term or the successive term for other good cause. That's simply a factually incorrect statement. But it's in the lease. It it's is in the lease, Your Honor, and what else could be in the lease is, and, and I understand that this is certainly the other end of the spectrum here, is that the lease might also warrant or require that the landlord perform a specific, you know, act, a physical act before he do, do that. And that is the case that was raised in Shannon, which the court did identify, entry. And that goes to the issue of whether the party has established its claim to a right of possession, entry. So that case, the specific requirement is not about verbatim language. It's about whether entry or a notice to quit will govern your ability to establish standing under 239 section one. But I, I wanna ask a question about the other case. I, um, so I, I'm confused now because normally when a case goes up to us, you can't keep doing things on it down below. So here we've got this decision, then the appeal bond includes this condition um, that says they can enter um, and give the keys over. Is that unusual? That I, I've done a lot of appeal bond cases, but I've never seen this sort of, con it's all about money. I'm not used to cases where it includes this language. Is that typical? I think, Your Honor, in a non-payment of rent case, it probably should maybe stay limited to whether or not the monies have been paid in exchange because that's ultimately the underlying case. Right. In a case of, in a case of cause, which this was, right. and in a case where we prevailed and there were concerns that the judge accurately considered under, again, 231 section 117, which I've highlighted for the court, right. it does give him the authority to enter additional orders. Wait so a minute, what, what, on what one, basis did you prevail? Excuse well, me? On what basis did you, I thought it was non-payment of rent. No, it was for chronic late payment of rent. Chronic late payment, late payment of rent, of rent. But it has to do with late payment of rent. That right? is a cause. That is a cause basis, Your Honor. So non-payment of rent is also actually cause under the lease agreement. Uh, uh, that's sufficient so cause for the landlord to proceed. It was, it and it's was, a, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And it's a different period of time, uh, and, and, and there's implications. For, so for it's a non-payment, that can't be a stay. Correct, and that also can Fine. be cured. Right, but if it is for, for, for a cause, um, or for some other reason, like the end of the tenancy, then there can be a stay. Correct. So it really matters which one it is. Absolutely. And in this case, it was clear in Judge Winnick's order. And the other point I did want to raise for the court and make sure is clear, I, I think Judge Winnick's order is actually very thoughtful as well. Um, what, is not, what doesn't appear in the record is that a tenant that's terminated from a, sec, a, a Section 8 tenancy may potentially have implications of losing your subsidy, depending on what the basis was for termination at the lower court. This is for chronic late payment of rent. Very uncommonly will a housing authority terminate for chronic late payment of rent. So this is a, the first justice of the Eastern Housing Court, which I sincerely believe made this thoughtful decision so that she would be able to preserve that voucher. Some of the other cases that my brother cites, which I did want to briefly mention because but I noticed I, my I'm, time is I'm still have, I, I still don't understand the process because you've got, there's, there's a whole separate jurisdictional issue about who's supposed to be deciding things. So this case is on appeal. The first case is on appeal and then there's this housing bond condition that's violated. And so while this case is in the SJC, the housing court is basically kicking her out for a different reason, right? Correct. It, and that, it's not for a different reason, Your Honor. I, I think I think it's well, but very it's, important. But normally that case would be in the SJC. I, I'm, by the way, I'm happy not to be the housing court, but I'm 
I'm just trying to understand how we're going to have those. Is that also very unusual? That I don't believe so, Your Honor. And under Heath, cited in uh, the various documents that were filed, it wasn't really in. Uh, it is in the record uh, on the second case mm -hmm. uh, under Heath v. Creedle. The court does retain jurisdiction to potentially dismiss that case. And in that case, what had happened was Which not court the retains jurisdiction? The housing court retains jurisdiction to, even though the case is on appeal and stayed in the SJC, the summary process case. Yes, Your Honor. And what, what I would argue is that they retain jurisdiction to enforce the judgment or execution, which is consistent with the statutory references that have been included in the briefs. So even though we've stayed the summary process case, so we can, the housing court can, because there's this condition in the housing bond, they can sort of overrule us. I don't believe the SJC has stayed the case. By taking the matter sua sponte, Your Honor, I do uh, agree that the court has decided that they want to be the ones to decide the underlying case. Summary process. I think process. we would have been in the same situation whether it was at the appeal court level or with the SJC level. And 185 sec uh, 185C section three specifically says that the housing court has concurrent jurisdiction with the Supreme Judicial Court. I don't imagine that was accidental either, Your Honor, that the idea being that they need to be able to enforce their orders that they issue in accordance but, but, with the judgment. But shouldn't they have done it otherwise? So the, the, the appeals here, there's an appeals bond. The, the, the tenancy still has to be managed. The landlord might need to get in there because there's a leak. Yes. But and you can't say, oh, well, it's in the SJC. Let's just ruin the unit and let the flood come in. But don't you go get an injunction? Yeah. Isn't that the way you do it? Your Honor, uh, the relief that was provided. Mandatory injunction to enter or whatever it might be? That is absolutely another course that can be Isn't taken. It's a better course? Well, yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's better, Your Honor, because at the end of the day, you're already dealing with a situation where you've prevailed on a particular case. And the statute specifically provides that the court can maintain that jurisdiction on orders that it's issued in, in furtherance of the landlord's interests. 239 section 5 does specifically reference that the court can issue a bond taking into consideration the landlord's interests and security and potential damage to their property. But isn't so the condition to pay to the plaintiff all damage and loss which the plaintiff may sustain by the withholding of possession of the land? So there's nothing here about non-financial conditions. Your Honor, I think 239 section 5 deals with as... Are you talking about some section other than 5C? No, Your Honor. Uh, well, 230... I, I have mentioned other sections and other chapters. 231 section 98 specifically references chapter 239 section 5, and it talks about appeal bond orders, which all seem to be really concerned about the money issue. I don't think it's accidental that 231.117 is in existence, which is that that also provides in cause-related cases the court's authority to be able to issue these types of orders, which I 100% agree are interlocutory, and that's included in the statutes that I've referenced. And had the defendant under 231 section 118 wished to contest that order, she had that right, she had that ability. All right, but thank you. Uh, Thank you, Your Honor. And Mr. Bowen, I know that I did not give you extra time to argue the appeals bond issue, and it was discussed. If you see a need for a 16L letter, I'm not saying you need to, but uh, out of fairness to you, since he argued it because we asked him and you didn't, you're invited if you wish to. But don't take any meaning as if I think you should. It's just <laughs> telling you that if, out of fairness to you because uh, it was argued by him and not by you. Thank you. Thank you.